Picture this. The game is 3-3 and 111 minutes have passed. You've just conceded an equalizer about 30 seconds ago and are pinned back in defense. Do you A. Mark the guy that's already scored three goals against you this season? Or B. Leave him with an open shot? Let's see how this plays out. Never a dull moment with this team, guys. Manchester United are the definition of never let your opponents know your next move. Or your fan base, or your manager, or anyone, really. United have somehow managed to lose points from winning positions three times in the space of seven days. It's anarchy out there at Old Trafford, it really is. A silver lining is the fact that somehow United have gone undefeated against Liverpool this season and even snatched a late winner in the FA Cup. The downside to this moment is that Chelsea did this exact same thing to them. If I were to tell you that a team faced 87 shots but somehow only conceded 7, what would you think? It makes no sense, right? How about if I were to tell you that that same team scored 6 goals in those 3 matches? It makes even less sense, right? But what does make sense is that they did not win even one of those matches. This is a team that relies on individual brilliance and luck only. And it's quite telling that luck for this team means drawing two games and losing one. Manchester United are six with a negative goal difference and genuinely haven't played convincingly in ages. It really does seem like the excitement of late game moments and other shenanigans is carrying the United fan base on a week by week basis. Injuries haven't been kind, but let's be real, United are not the only ones in Europe to face injuries and teams that have spent considerably less have been able to make do. In a week where Sam Allardyce was spotted in the director's box with Sir Jim Ratcliffe, what are we supposed to make of all of this? It's time for the monthly Manchester United rant, guys. Yo, what's going on guys? Hope we're all doing well. I'm Tinashe, welcome back to the channel. In other news, we hit 300k the other day. You guys are unbelievable, but we'll talk more about that at the end of the video. Football does this weird thing where you can go into a match expecting the worst and then have those fears confirmed almost immediately afterwards just to have your expectations vastly exceeded and then drop right back down to earth when reality hits and not really know how to feel about it by the end of it, all within about 90 minutes. That was me after Liverpool. But because it probably makes more sense, we should start this video off with the Brentford match. United vs Brentford is always a tricky matchup. I never know what to expect going into this one because it quite literally can be anything. A comfortable win or a devastating 4-0 defeat leaving Ronaldo looking like this. This match was the latter, not including Ronaldo though. Andre Onana has saved 120 shots this season and leads the league on that stat line. It looks impressive on the surface, and it is. But you also have to realize that this stat is incredibly misleading. Yes, he has been great and has improved vastly over the season, especially since those early months, but he's only putting up numbers like this because Man United have conceded the greatest number of shots, 253, yet somehow have only conceded the 15th greatest number of goals in the league. It makes no sense. 31 of them were against Brentford. And guys, you really just needed to watch this match. It was dreadful finishing from start to finish. It was, it was awful. Brentford found themselves in insane positions all the way throughout the match, yet somehow could not score. Offsides goals, crossbars, posts, you name it, all while Man United are just sitting back and holding on for dear life, which is why it makes sense that United scored in the 96th minute to lead the match and snatch the three points. But you see, this is why I support this club. They're compassionate. They completely understand when injustice has been served. So they gifted Brentford an equalizer in the 99th minute. I'm choosing to believe that that was their reasoning to help me cope. You guys have to let me have this. But yeah, that was Brentford. Apart from a goal that made no sense, a 1 out of 10 performance. And that one point is really just awarded for being on the pitch. It's kind of like getting points on a test paper for writing your name down at the top. Then came Chelsea. In layman's terms, this is essentially what we refer to as when a stoppable force meets a movable object. A proper mid-table scrap. Both of these teams are just awful, man. Not just in their two matches against each other in the league, but over the course of the season. It's tough watching United and Chelsea these days. Two teams that used to be so great whittled down to look nothing like they used to only a couple years ago. I remember having this feeling when watching Barcelona vs United last year in the, I think it was the Champions League, no, it was the Europa League uh, playoff match, thinking, 
I mean, this is a great throwback to a time in the past when these two teams were great. Yeah, it was in the Europa League, but there was a little bit of excitement. I don't get that with Chelsea United these days. It doesn't feel like a big match anymore. Chelsea broke out the gate strong in this one and scored with Conor Gallagher in the fourth minute. And this is where the initial problem lies with Manchester United. The left side. We have no left back at all right now. Luke Shaw has been gone for a while. Tyrell Malasia may as well be non-existent at this point. So we have Aaron Wan-Bissaka or Diogo Dalo filling in there. This right here is the position of our left back for Chelsea's first goal. Both Milo Gusto and Cole Palmer have more space than a lockdown stadium. And United's defense knew the assignment, so they practiced social distancing on Conor Gallagher. I skipped past it earlier, but here we have a still right before Brentford's equalizer. Which side has it come from? But it's not like the right side is any better in the grand scheme of things because only a few minutes after this, Anthony brought down Marco Correa on the right side to concede a penalty. To be fair to Anthony, he did have a pretty good game here by his standards. He even assisted the third goal, but there's just so much wrong here. Not only is he not even on goal side of Chelsea's player, but the challenge is wild. As we've come to find out about United this season, the only way they're able to crawl themselves out of the holes they dig for themselves is by lashing onto mistakes by the opposition. It was only after a wayward pass by Caicedo that Garnacho was able to latch onto a ball and get a goal back. I'll take it though. And another thing we've come to find out about this team is that they only really switch on when luck like this happens. And when they switch on, they really do turn on the heat. We know they can do that, which is what makes them so frustrating. Two really well-worked goals by Bruno, then Garnacho put them in front, really solidifying how open this match was and how defenses were not king whatsoever. It's truly something. As a neutral, this was peak football. More so when United just decided to up and throw the game away. From minute 67 when their third goal went in up until the final stretch of the game, yeah, there were chances for Chelsea here and there, but I think most people assumed United to walk away with the three points. Leave it to Eric Ten Hag's men to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. A penalty conceded from where? The left side of the defense. Dalo just couldn't handle Noni Madueke and brought him down only for Cole Palmer to make it 3-3. And then the play of the game. In what universe are they allowing Cole Palmer to have a free fucking shot on goal at any point of the game, no less in the 111th minute? Without this man, Chelsea would be in a relegation scrap. There's a reason for that. And yet United didn't seem to care. He scored four goals against Manchester United so far this season, which I guess only makes sense considering the team that he started his career with. I had to take a moment to gain composure when I watched this unfold. You know when you just sit down and stare at the screen in hopes that the words on it change at some point? That point never came. Which is what made what happened next feel so strange. The fact that Liverpool pretty much did the exact same thing they did against Man United no less than three weeks ago at the same venue is a little bit embarrassing for them. Luis Diaz's goal was great, some really good athleticism. By the end of the first half, it seemed as though United had gone into defense first mode despite being a goal down. It's a familiar feeling for this team. Moments like this are a constant reminder of the gap between United and the best teams in the league, particularly Arsenal, Liverpool, and Man City, but realistically, every team above them and a few of them below them, honestly. But when it comes to Liverpool in this matchup, what's the point of dominating the opposition and racing to a lead if you're not going to make your ascendancy count and just let them back in the game? This is the exact reason why Jurgen Klopp was going crazy on the touchline. Even after Diaz had put Liverpool in the lead, he knew what was coming. But the funny thing about that is that even though he did, I doubt any of the Manchester United players did. This is the XG for both teams at the end of the first half. Is this a team that you should be afraid of? Gerald Kwanzaa certainly didn't seem to think so. That's the only explanation I can give for him straight up giving the ball back to Bruno Fernandes just after the break. That or just the lapse of concentration, you, you can take your pick really. Within about five seconds, this mistake happened and Bruno brought United back into it. And what a goal it was. Quick to latch onto the ball, quick to spot the keeper off his line, and quick to make the most of it. That's my captain. But at the same time, this is exactly what I mean when I say that the United fan base and even the players probably at this point are being carried week by week by vibes, not much else. No tactics, just vibes. This was the first shot that United had all game. Up until that point, they were very much second best by a very large margin against Liverpool. And just like the first goal against Chelsea, this was a gift wrapped present. And then like clockwork, the game really came into life. If you turned on the TV at that exact moment 
and had no idea what happened in the first half, you would think that the teams were somewhat evenly matched. You might have even thought that United were on top. The corpse of Casemiro, who was having a nightmare of a game up until that point, very nearly put United ahead a couple of seconds after the equalizer. Rashford, who'd been getting double teamed all afternoon, was running at the defense with what looked like confidence, but I'm not sure. Can we all have a moment of silence for the future victims of Kobe Mainu? This kid's the real deal. 18 years old and the calmest head on the pitch for United. He can carry with confidence. He can press out the midfield. And now we're learning that he can finish with the best of them. The one the goal was not an isolated incident. And neither was the goal that put United in the lead. Gets the ball just inside the box. Swivels and nails it right in the top right. Runs off to the corner flag and calmly salutes the crowd. He's 18. We have a habit of hyping up young players that come into the team and sometimes it comes back to bite us. I mean, online, on Twitter, on Reddit, everywhere you look, people were making the comparisons between Maynou's goal and Federico Makeda's goal that he scored in 2009, I believe, against Aston Villa. It's a bit of a reach because the circumstances are different, but at the same time, it was against Liverpool. And even further to that, this guy has shown us way too much for us to actually believe that he's just a flash in the pan. We're not where we need to be just yet, but the leap from Fred last year to Kobe Maynou this year is already the biggest upgrade of the year. I want to highlight a few things from this goal that I picked up after watching it several times over. This guy is hungry, he's always willing to get on the ball no matter what, he's not afraid in the slightest, and he's hyper aware of his surroundings. It was him that carried the ball into the midfield in the first place and passed it off to Garnacho on the left flank. He remains in the line of sight of the ball carrier and offers himself as an option all the way through. Then he receives the ball, takes it away from the opposing defender, knows exactly where the goal is, so all he has to do is swing his foot on a full turn. Jurgen Klopp couldn't believe it. But of course United don't really like nice things, so they conceded their third penalty in two matches. Guess which side of the pitch the opponent's attack came from. If you said left at home, you'd be wrong. Just kidding, you'd be right. Of course you'd be right. Salah, who scored more goals in this matchup than anyone else, was never going to miss, and that's how it ended. Manchester United have a really long way to go. I mean, let me give credit where credit is due. There were some really good performances over the past couple of games. Against Liverpool, Maynou, of course. Maguire, I thought was great. Bruno was pressing really well and scored a great goal at a time where we really needed a goal. Dalo played well. Uh, Onana was great too. Garnacho was always lively. But overall, there wasn't really that much to praise. The tactics were, well, I don't really know what the tactics were, if I'm being honest with you. If Liverpool hadn't gift-wrapped a goal for United, I'm pretty sure they would have just been pinned within their own half for the remainder of the game. When it comes to Ten Hag, I don't really have much more to say about him. I don't see a world where he stays at United next season. I don't really see any arguments in favor of him staying either. He's gotten a lot of the players that he wants. Sometimes we can see what he's trying to do with the formations, the tactics, whatever, but it doesn't work out most of the time. So what can we say? I'll make a longer dedicated video for the title race in general over the last few games, but for the moment, maybe it's worth saying a couple things on the teams in it after watching them play this weekend. Arsenal is looking dangerous and their team is running at full steam right now. I watched them against Brighton and they were incredible. Their efficiency across the pitch is masterful. They also have a pretty much full strength team with the exception of Jurian Timber who has been out since like game week two anyway. Manchester City is Manchester City. De Bruyne showed us all why he's maybe the best Premier League midfielder ever with a well taken brace and City ran riot. I made a video on Phil Foden the other day talking about the unbelievable form that he's in. Giving him praise was controversial to some people in the comments which I found a little bit strange, but tells you all you really need to know about fan biases. But the kind of team that can bench a player in that kind of form and still win extremely comfortably away from home is not a normal team. And no, I don't expect City to bench De Bruyne in favor of Foden because of form. I'm just using this as an example to talk about how powerful this team is. Let's see how they do versus Madrid. Liverpool are probably the weakest of the three teams at the moment, in my eyes. They're incredible, but they're more prone to mistakes and letting their opponents right back into games unnecessarily. Case in point, United. I'm pretty sure that at the very least, one of the teams in this race is gonna go undefeated for the remainder of the season, or at the very least, damn near it. With the amount of quality here, if any of these teams don't, then they will be out of the race. It's gonna be an interesting next few weeks. And before anyone asks on this video, I would prefer for none of the teams in this race to win the league, but 
If I had to make a choice, it would be Arsenal. I've seen some comments on my Twitter or my Instagram or previous videos of people asking who I prefer to win the league. It's Arsenal. Of course it's Arsenal, this is a silly question, I'm a Manchester United fan. Okay, we're in the deep zone now. If you haven't clicked off the video, you're a real one. I just want to do a quick thank you for helping get this channel to 300k, it still makes no sense to me. I started making these videos during lockdown because I didn't have much else to do. All I was doing was waking up, rolling over, doing my remote work, playing some PlayStation, going to bed and then repeating for months on end. Never in a million years did I think 100 people would watch these, no less. 300k. Really, really grateful for everyone that's tuned in. Got a lot planned. I mean, more of these, you know, scripted reaction type videos, longer 30 minute video essays like uh, used to make since the very beginning. Um, maybe some goofy videos here and there. Really excited for all of it. And all I'm trying to do is have fun with these and hopefully you guys have fun with them too. At the end of the day, all I am is just a football fan that doesn't have much else better to do. And there we have it. That's all for me today. Hope you guys enjoy. Hope you're having a great day. Cheers. And I'll catch you in the next one.